Hello and welcome back inside the Park for May for podcast number 858. That's right. This is Todd, a.k.a. Negative Camber. You know why I've asked you here. Oh, that's all I need you to do. For your kind consideration, we're going to talk about Formula One news. What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about Andretti's engine dilemma. We're going to talk about Button and Braun movie. The FIA's review of Hamilton and Stroll's, you know, Qatar antics. And the mandatory pit stop. We're going to cover all of that and more on this episode. Before doing that, of course, you know what I always have to do. I have to introduce my guest tonight, which of course means I got to go all the way to the left. No, the right coast of American Nestler Nation's capital. You know her, you love her. It's the lovely, the redoubtable. Grace, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm sure the weather on the left coast is better, but otherwise, it's fine here on the right coast. Ah. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. Uh, it's pretty cold here today. Chilly <laughs> here. Sure Chilly nice in the Midwest. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man, do we got some news to cover? What about that Andretti engine dilemma, Grace? I'm, I mean, I'm oh, just... Oh, my favorite. Oh, I'm just oh, biting whatever. nails over here. Nobody you cares. Know? I, I don't know. Who still cares <laughs> about this story? We've been talking about this for like 12 weeks I know, now. Oh, I know. You know, I make thought, a decision. You know what was funny is I was getting ready to do notes on that. Well, the... I already we already covered the Andretti thing, and I was like, "No, I think that came out after the last it podcast, did. and we haven't talked about the Andretti engine thing." Yeah. Although it's been, you know, on the it's been in the crockpot for the last week. I mean, it's have you guys ever noticed when you make some a crockpot? I mean, I love a crockpot; if they're handy, they're easy. You just throw everything in there; it's done. But man, when you pull food out of there, it is like the surface of the sun, hot. Oh yeah! Oh my gosh! Yes. It is it's, so yeah. hot, you know? It's crazy. Yeah. That's why, so if you make, a hat, you know, uh, a little life hack here for you. If you make, huh. um, like, pasta, you know, like, like baked ziti or something yeah. in a crock pot, you have to take heavy-duty foil and make, like, a little collar that goes around the back. Because uh. the heating element is always in the, is most usually in the back of the crock pot, right? Like, the whole thing yeah. is like hot, right? And so you have to put, like, aluminum foil over that so that it doesn't burn your pasta. Wow. If you're ever making like fish or pasta or something that's delicate and not just like a slab of meat. Well, but you're right. It is always the surface of the yeah. sun when it comes out. So there you're you right. go, folks. Here's your crock pot top tip of the week. Huh? I'm a big fan. How big about fan. that? I guarantee you nobody thought they'd tune into this podcast this so week and get a crock pot top tip. I love it. No, because it's somehow good. working remote, I have less time to make dinner and I don't know how that actually happened. Uh -huh. Yeah, like, cause it used, I think it's just because I used to be like, I left. Like, I had a 45 minute commute. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I gotta go. <laughs> now I'm yeah. like, I'll just answer a few more emails. The yeah. next thing I know, I'm like, oh, we're gonna starve. Yeah. Yeah, no, I so, got it. You know, where I was going with this analogy was that this story's been in a crock pot, you know, stewing all week. Oh, and it's um, hot. Oh, it's hot. It's hot. It's boiling. It is boiling hot, like the surface of the sun. Let's talk about this, shall we? So, most of you that troll the website, and that's probably about all three of you, um, will notice that I posted a uh, article of this that was uh, sourcing Auto Sport, and uh, and so they had a really nice article over there. Um, I can't remember who wrote it. Probably Jonathan Noble of all things. But anyway, sure. uh, the effervescent Jonathan Noble. Um, and so anyway, a couple of weeks ago, we discussed Andretti being approved by the FIA to join the grid as the 11th team. And while that was one hurdle, they still have to get F1 approval, which is yet to come. Now, all the headlines and everything were like, hey, they're approved. Not why, not, not quite. So it's still got to go to F1. Right. There's a lot of folks in the, in the F1 inter circles inner circles that um uh, aren't too keen about an 11 team imagine that um uh, isn't that all of them <laughs> no there's a couple that that said they're okay zach. with it zach of course because he's buddies with michael williams and haas because what does it make a difference to them right <laughs> i don't know i was trying to think williams may have had some heartburn over it i think yeah um oh yeah, I, I actually can't i take that back you're right williams for sure would because that's direct competition to them i'm there you go you're right i take that back so maybe just zach yeah, right? Maybe that's the only friend. I don't know. Could be. Um, right. Sorry. I think maybe Alpine said they didn't really care either. But anyway, that's what the story is about. So it seems, as I mentioned last week, that the agreement in principle that Andretti had for a Renault slash Alpine engine supply that would see them 
uh, set for engine supplies until GM slash Cadillac got their power unit up and running for 2026. Well, it seems, according to Alpine, that that agreement has expired, at least according to them. Um, Alpine says that, you know, this is great. It's expired, though. And, uh, you know, we need to have a decision. Um, expired, 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 expired. Thanks, expired. Thank <laughs> Thanks you, Aunt I was... Bonnie. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I know the commercial you're talking about. Uh, so uh, anyway, Alpine says, you know, look, is that uh huh? That horse is run. If we're going right. to do anything with them, that's a whole new negotiation. A whole new deal needs to be renegotiated along with the new terms, and that needs to be done quickly. Says Alpine. If they're to mill all the parts and engines needed for a 2024 second team engine supply program. Um, and, you know, at first I thought, well, that's kind of heavy handed. But, you know, it is October, mid-October, and that's probably yeah. right. They probably do need to know if they're supplying it and all of the terms and everything and money and and, and all of that needs to be agreed to so they can start making the engines, um, because they're going to be supplying however many they make for their own team. They got to double that, right? Yeah, yeah. Because testing starts in like February or March, right? Like, yeah, or next week or something. I don't know. I don't know. Well, uh, yeah. but yeah, yeah, February, right, right. Um, yeah, so this has prompted many to wonder if Andretti might be getting a little stiff armed out of the series for lack of an engine. But the FIA president, Mohammed bin Salim, otherwise known here locally as Eddie Everywhere. Well, Grace, he's weighed in on the matter. You'll be happy to know. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hold I on to your seat. My I rolled my eyes and I realized, well, people that are just listening to this can't see my eye roll. But No, they don't. Yeah, you got a Great. verbal eye roll. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think you know what the problem is just as well as I, I do. I think you do, Grace. Uh, uh, so yeah. here we go. Um, <clears throat> here's what he said. He said, quote, In the beginning, Andretti will have to decide on one of two engines. It works that way with the rules. Nobody can say no to them. If all the teams say no, then the FI has the power to go on and say the least two engine manufacturers being used, then we put them in a draw and we take one. It's not a secret, and I'm sure it is either Alpine or Honda, and one of them would win because that is the rules, end quote. That, that's the rules. You know, instead of just saying, oh, you know, hey, look, yeah, there was some discussion. The FI is engaged talking to Andretti yep. Alpine and the common people. And I'm sure, uh, you know, a resolution of this will be fine. Certainly, you know, there is regulations that uh, uh, that tie the manufacturers to a supply. And I'm sure we'll work out the details. Not that he immediately goes right to the jugular. Right. And he says, uh, the FI has the power to go on and say at least two of you and we'll put you in a hat and we'll draw it out. It totally has the like, Dad. I don't care who started it. I'm finishing it <laughs> vibes, right? It like, does. It all does. of you go to your room. I don't care. Yeah. I'm finishing it. That's yeah. that is the tone I see this in, right? Like, yeah. I don't care anymore. I'm just gonna pick one. I'm gonna pick a rabbit out of the hat, Rocky, and yeah. we're gonna see what happens. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't care who's right, who's wrong. This is the this I'm is the result. I'm picking one. Uh, if you two can't figure it out on your own, then I'm going to have to step in and pick it up. Right. That's right. Yeah. And doors are a privilege, so don't push it. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, you know, the rules do account for an engine supply for teams, and this would give them an option for the manufacturer with the fewest customer teams. And remember, this all kind of cropped up because uh, when Red Bull was having those issues with Renault and was looking to get another engine supply, everybody said no. <laughs> and it was kind of crappy. We don't like them. Yeah. Uh, Mercedes it's like, force... ooh, whoo, would you look at the time? Oh, no, we just couldn't possibly handle uh, uh, supplying them. Meanwhile, they sign up Williams and everybody else, right? McLaren. Yeah. Uh, Ferrari's like, oh, no, we couldn't possibly uh, help them out. Meanwhile, they're sign, sign up Haas and Sauber and all that. Um, yeah, right. It's the it's the meme from Forrest Gump when he's trying to find a seat on the bus, right? The yeah. seat's taken. This yeah. seat's taken. Right. Right. Got to go have to sit with Jenny. Right. 
because we're not giving you an engine. That's exactly it. Uh, Despite that, there are some who aren't convinced that the regulations guarantee an engine supply, if you can believe that. And any intent would have to be agreed upon as of according to the regulations, June's 1st, which uh, the preceding year in which they intend to participate, which means they would have had last June to have that done for the next season, right? So that's passed. I'm assuming they can work that out. Um, So it's getting a little interesting indeed. And uh, MBS or Eddie Everywhere said this. He said he was asked about the potential uncertainty over the situation. He said, quote, we will not answer in that detail. There are a lot of regulations. There are the sporting regulations and we have the Concord Agreement. We're going to follow the rules, whether from the regulator or the promoter, end quote. Um, so there you go. So the article at Autosport goes on to say that uh, uh, MBS believed the push to get GM to build its own engine longer term was great news for F1. And he, and he said this about that. He said, I'm optimistic with GM coming with the power unit. I'm very optimistic, not just optimistic. Uh, He said in the last 20 months to have two major OEMs, which is Audi and Andretti GM, and to have a power unit from Audi and we're on the right track or having power unit from Cadillac, that is an achievement, end quote. I'm sure some of that's all sort of lost in translation and and non-native language, but anyway. I mean, I mean, that is... That is true. That would be if GM does come in. That is a that is a great achievement, right? That you've yeah, been able yeah. to bring Audi and GM in. So I just don't yeah. think that's very likely. But um, you got one. I mean, I, I mean, I feel like for as long as we've been doing this, it's like, oh, Audi's in. Oh, just kidding. Like, I mean, so there is that. It is pretty impressive that at least Audi is going to join. But I don't. Yeah, and Cadillac. See Michael. Cadillac says they're they're you know there's. They're hooked up. 2026 is a different engine regulation. There's no MGUH. Right. So mm-hmm. Cadillac is very much on board with developing the powertrain. I think it'll be interesting. I'm 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 cautiously optimistic about it because it's fiercely complex. Not that GM can't make a complex racing engine. They can. It's just it's really that performance level, right? And when you're coming in uh, you know, they're not going to do that now because the engine rules have been pretty solid for a long time. Uh, but coming in with that new engine when everybody else is coming in with a new engine, um, at least maybe that's a, a little more of a level playing field. But there is still this learning curve over their hybrid, their MGU-K uh, and those kind of things, yeah. uh, working with a standardized ECU and that kind of thing. So that's going to be tough for GM. Not that they can't do it. I think they can. Um I think it'll t- take them time to develop that reliability out of it that the other teams have enjoyed mm-hmm. so far. Uh, but they're pretty convinced that that's what they're going to try to do uh, for 2026. So, um, Of course. What are they going to say? We're not going to be ready? I mean, of course. Yeah. Um, that's what they're going to say. And I also think, I mean, we always talk about drivers, like seat time is seat time, right? You can put them in simulators. You can put them in GP2 cars. You can put them in Indy cars. Seat time is seat time until you get somebody in a race, in a Formula One car, you really don't know. And so I think that applies to things other than just the drivers, right? And yeah. so I think that's what you're speaking to, that there's, of course, going to be a learning time, a learning curve because seat time is seat time. And you can look at things and drawings and dyno tests or whatever you do to, like, do sort of a simulator like you would do for a driver with the engine. But seat time is seat time. Until you get it in there in earnest, you know, you won't know. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Well, suffice it to say that uh, Andretti, if they got the nod from FOM, and some believe this whole engine thing is them trying to stiff arm them out of the sport, but um, if that's... mm -hmm. Well, let's just say that Alpine and Andretti get together in the next few weeks and they iron out a new deal. Other teams could say, well, no, no, the rules say June 1st. You know, they're past June 1st. Sorry, you're out of luck. Um, worst case scenario it could delay the whole thing for another season, but um, I don't know. Be interesting to see. How, I don't. None of this is over yet, and it's going to be very no. interesting to see how this boils out. I just feel like they're just going to keep putting more hurdles. 
Yeah. Like every time he's like, okay, I got to check this box. All right, I checked it. What's yeah. next? It's just like a wild goose chase. And yeah. they're just trying to like wear him down and make him break up. Like it's like a boyfriend and, you know, it's like in a boyfriend, girlfriend kind of relationship or any sort of a partner relationship. Like I'm just trying to be such a miserable human that you break up with me. <laughs> and then I can say like, oh, I didn't break up with you. No, but I made it so terrible that you did it. Right. Like, so I feel like they're just trying to like, wear him down until he's finally like fine i'm not gonna do it and then they can say we never told michael he couldn't do it right we just made it so difficult that he yeah. didn't do it well it's like one of those things is like it's moving goalposts right and mm -hmm. either he knew the that where the goalposts were and we just didn't we're just finding out about it now but if that's not the case it does seem like it's like oh <laughs> oh wait a minute yeah you did pass the fia approval but did we mention that you now have to get right. approved by fom oh and by the way did you did you did we mention that you got to have your engine deal uh done by june 1st okay. or did we did did we mention that or uh -huh. uh, yeah i don't know did you get that email yeah I think, did I think you the, get the I memo think, but i think what people underestimate is michael andretti stick to itness yeah, like, I feel like if anybody is going to like just keep meeting your hurdles, he's going to do it. What else? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that he's guy like a Jack driven. Russell Terrier, man. You know, he's just absolutely. And so I think you underestimate he will never break up with you, no matter how terrible of a partner you are. He's <laughs> yeah. in this relationship until you break up with him. He's going to figure it out. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dogged determination. We'll see how it ends up. But what's the space? Um more power It'll to keep him. us busy, busy in the off season. So. <clears throat> yeah, we'll have a lot to talk yeah. about in the off season. Won't uh -huh. that be grand fun? Uh, it's almost like talking about tires all off season. Yeah, uh, no thanks. Um, yeah. Let's see. Okay, boy, breaking news, Grace. This just in. Yep. Uh, what is sure to be a box office smash? I can't is wait. the new movie nay 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 the new docu series about Button and Braun or is it bon Braun and Button? Sounds like a place well, no. of Diagon Alley, doesn't it? Go down well, to Button and Braun's and get me a yeah. No, Ruben's Bear Keller. We're just gonna pretend like he wasn't at the TV. I know, either. I know, yeah. Right, like yeah, yeah. All right, no, whatever the headlines, that guy. The headlines are talking about Button and Braun. The new Braun I mean, did, movie with Button. He did stuff. It's he was like the champion. He's like, you know, I understand that, but you know, yeah. poor Rubens, man. Well, Give no, it's, some, it's Rubino. That's right. Who doesn't love him some Rubino? Come it's on. an interesting story there, too, man. Like, Yeah, oh. it is. Rubens got a very interesting story. So anyway, mm -hmm. for those of you that are stateside, uh, November 15th, circle that on your calendar as the release oh. date. For the new movie about Braun, it's called Braun, the impossible Formula One story. Um, make sure you mark that. It is going to be on Disney Plus in amongst all those horrible Star Wars reboot series. And um, <laughs> sorry, I watched but they're all terrible. Of them. They're just terrible. <laughs> they're just bad. No, wait. Did you watch Andor? Yes. Andor, you didn't like Andor? It was, it was of the ones, it was a little better. Yes, I agree with that. Ah, it's like, all right, but fine. just see, just wait to see what they're putting together in that prison. It's like, uh, okay. All right. I kind of got that. Uh, but right. but they were, and here's the other thing. You that's going to be our next, uh, that's going to be our off-season podcast, folks. It is. I'm just going to tell you right up front. Here's the other thing. They live... In 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 a galaxies, right? Right. In a galaxy with all these different planets, right? And yeah. you know that the whole virtual production LED volume that they're using to do yeah. these backdrops, green screening, and all that stuff. You know, it's right. easier to do desert landscapes on that damn thing because everyone lives on a freaking Tatooine desert-like planet. Everything is based on a desert planet, and there's, like, buildings with no doors, and it's like, you guys have starships that go faster than the speed of light. You can't afford a damn door. You can't, I mean, build a decent house. You guys live in huts in a desert, you know? Every single yeah. show, they're always centered around a desert. What happened to Endor, for crying out loud? Go see the Ewoks, for crying out loud. 
You know? I mean, part of it's Those Ahsoka, poor there bastards haven't seen anyone since the Death Star got blown up in their orbit. Oh, poor things. Right. No. I know they're fluffy, but I think that I mean there were some trees in Ahsoka. It wasn't mm, all desert. Well, I haven't seen that one. I full disclaimer, I haven't seen that one. I don't know what that's all about. I don't know what's I going mean, on there. I think I think overall you're you're pretty right. I would just say that <laughs> I think Andor doesn't fit under the most of Star Wars is on yeah. Disney Plus is crap. And the other one, the the what's the the first one, uh, the. Um... Mandalorian. Yeah. Nope. I mean, yeah. here's a guy going around and basically gets his butt kicked everywhere he goes. I, I mean, it's kind of like Worf in Star Trek. He was their security guy, always getting his butt kicked by about everybody. That's a fair point. You no, know? I mean, I can't, I can't get through the Mandalorian because we start watching it too late at night. And I fall asleep. Mm. I've seen like three episodes, so I don't think that really. Yeah. 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 All the people love Mandalorian, but I have not gotten through it. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I just uh, something going on there. Anyway, this is going to redeem Disney Plus. This is going to make their viewer <laughs> numbers surge like Drive to Survive. That's right. Um, Forget Ahsoka. We're all about uh, Ross Braun and Jensen Button. That's right. Here's why. I, I do just think it's going to be kind of cool, though. I mean, yeah. it could go off the rails. I don't know. But I think it's going to be kind of cool, and here's why. So the story documents how Ross Braun saved the Honda Works team after the Japanese car maker decided to ex exit the sport abruptly. Remember, back in 2008, right. you and I were podcasting. Hello. We were here. 900 and some odd episodes. We were podcasting back then when it was a desert wasteland, and nobody dare even download it at an F1 podcast. We were both we were both in different houses at the time, but we were we doing were. it. We were doing it. And back then, what did I call BMW? The ultimate quitting machine, right? I was furious yeah. with them leaving. So you had the 2008 bubble that crashed financial housing and all that. And all of these car companies just pulled the plug immediately and bailed. Oh. Toyota, Honda, and BMW, right? And I was furious with them for doing so. The series is, but get this, the series is to be narrated by master thespian Keanu Reeves. That's great. I do huh? love me some Keanu Reeves. Who doesn't? I'm in on that. Who love doesn't? That. And it's going to include interviews from Braun himself, right? Yes. And drivers, get this, Jensen Button, and our friend Rubens Barrichello. Rubens Barrichello. You Very gotta good. have Rubino in there. It's also going to, and the Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton is gonna love this. It's also going to include interviews with Christian Horner. Oh. They were, Horner was their main rival at the time. That's why they have Christian yeah. in there. Everybody's like, oh my gosh. Horner, I hate that guy. Um, so yeah, you Mercedes fans will be I excited. Hate, I hate that guy, but he should be in there. Oh, I like Christian. Those two things are You're mixing it up. I like that. Uh, I like it's the that. same mix. But it's the same mixing over and over again. Yeah, you know, it's it's you know, it's it's his thing, man. Did you watch the Beckham series? I did not. Huh. Is he in that? Uh, no, no. Oh, but but <laughs> his wife is. Well, in, yeah, in certain right. things, right? The Spice Girls, right? Yeah, yeah, With Victoria. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's in there. Uh, it was I didn't interesting. Know what the connection, connection. Yeah, was it was. There. It was Christian's wife. Um, yeah. So also, your friend and mine, Nick Fry, will be I in there. I do love some Nick Fry. Who shake, doesn't shake, shake. love some Nick Fry? Shake, shake, shake. Hashtag, it's, magic you know, the ball. Magic 8-Ball, remember? We yes. used to say so that that's... the Honda team was being ran by the Magic 8-Ball, so they didn't know what to do. Yes. Shake, 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 you know, looks outcome likely. You know, that's what they were, yeah. would do that. That's right. So that's if you're saying shake, decisions. shake, shake, that's what we mean. And Nick Fry only... was the guy that we were convinced ha he owned the Magic 8-Ball. Because that's the only way their decisions made any sense, mm -hmm. right? Like, because otherwise you're just like, why? Huh? Why did you do that? Oh, right. you're using a magic eight ball to make decisions. Oh, now I understand. Right. Fine. Right. Well, the good news for all of you, it is a four-part series all right. that focuses on how a desperate Honda was trying to unload its work team and eventually pulled the plug with Braun saving the entire team for a symbolic pound, one pound at the last minute. One pound. I look like uh, Matthew McConaughey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, then it was secured. They secured a engine deal from Mercedes. Went on to right. win the championship with the trick double diffuser concept that left everyone flat-footed. 
right? It was an amazing story. You and I lived through it. We podcasted through it. We did. Um, and then Braun was sold to Mercedes, which now is the team that you see now with Total Wolf and Lewis Hamilton. That Mercedes, that was Braun, and they went on to win eight championships. It's That's an amazing right. story, right? Um, so very unlikely outcome and championship from the most unlikely team. It is a very cool story, and I'm sure yeah, it'll be done well. Yeah, should be uh, done. I well. look forward. I look forward to how uh, if it's how truthful it is versus how drive to surviving it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I think yeah, this will probably be a little more on point. I think. I think so too. Yeah, I think, I think so, so too. Yeah. And then when you're done watching that, then you can hop over and watch Star Wars characters happily uh, stuck on desert planets. So you can do that over there. So there yes. you go. All in one and stop. You get your desert planet, you know, stuck on a desert planet thing. And then you get the Braun F1, right? Yeah. So it's good for that. All right. Let's talk about, oh, so we had a little, we had some things happen in Qatar, Grace. And before I jump into this story, <laughs> we what, did. Yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so Lance not having a good time. Um, he was not at not all. Happy. When he, they asked him a question. Yeah. He, what did they ask him? Like, you know, because they, they always do the post race thing. Yeah. He said it was shit. Yeah, and but there was one. Oh, I guess it was like after the sprint race or after qualif. I don't know with the sprint race and two qualifyings. And there's like they, there's like twelve TED notebooks and they talked to him like sixteen times. I can't remember which interview I watched, but one of them they're like, you know, they gave him the like, how was your race today? And he was kind of like, I drove around the track. Like yeah, he was, he's not, not even playing the game anymore. He's not even like trying to yeah. do the like George Russell. Well, it was nice today, and the guy's no. back at the factory. Nothing. He's just like, it sucked. I hate this. I drove on the track. I'm going home. Yeah, yeah. very unhappy. It's not great. Not good. Yeah. I feel bad for him. Um, so he had that uh, with the shoving the physio, and then you had the other incident that came out of that. So he had Lewis, uh, you know, slamming the door on George, sandwiching George. Lewis spins out. Um, it's a safety car. So the safety car comes out on track. It's making, it's it collected the grid. It's making, and so there's a shot of Lewis just getting across the road as the safety car yeah. goes right behind him with George Russell in the lead there. Um, it was kind of like, it, it was a cool picture. I mean, it was a cool shot, yeah. you know, for the photogs and stuff. Um, you know, it was a newsworthy kind of dramatic picture, right? Um, right. And that was cool. But unfortunately, um, yeah, you can't do that. Um, you can't walk across a hot track like that as he did. He walked across that hot track while it was still cars on there for yeah. his actions. Lewis was summoned to the stewards and given his first reprimand of the season and fined 50,000 euros of which 25,000 was suspended for the remainder of the season pending no further breach of a similar nature, which I'm sure he won't have. So it'll cost him 25 large. Yeah. But a week on from the incident, and the FIA are now revisiting this issue and wants to look closer at the matter, right? So right. that headline starts a whole thing, you know, on social media. But, oh, my gosh, they're picking on Lewis. I hate Lewis. They're a bunch of, you know, evil people and blah, 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 blah. It's, it's, I, I don't think it's that, folks. I think what they want to revisit is the actual incident itself and the issues that it may or may not cause or the clarifications it may need. Here's what the FIA said. The FIA, quote, the FIA is revisiting the incident in which Lewis Hamilton crossed a live track during Qatar Grand Prix. The FIA notes that Lewis was apologetic during the subsequent stewards hearing into the incident and acknowledged that the crossing was a serious safety breach. However, in view of his role model status, the FIA is concerned about the impression his actions may create on younger drivers, end quote. Okay. Now, what? you can't deny that the guy doesn't have his foot on the throat of social media and has a lot of influence because he touts his, his platform all the time. Yeah. He does have a lot of influence. All right. All right? I get that. Um, my hunch is what they're wanting to do is I, my, I, nothing, I suspect nothing's going to happen to Lewis. But perhaps what they're going to do is take a longer look at it the timing, the issues, speeds, all that kind of th stuff, in order to argue or solicit a tightening of the penalties 
for that right. kind of thing. Um, right. And I think there was an incident in Italy, maybe, with a driver walking across a hot track and carting and got hit and and his legs were messed up. Um, and so they want to try to tighten that up, I would imagine, and make it a little more severe so it doesn't happen again. It would be my hunch. Um, so they want to look at that. Um, good. Yeah. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? What do you think? Am I off on that? No. I, I mean – I guess what I, um, I hate the whole, like, you're a role model. Like, somebody looks up to everybody, right? Like, I don't know what you, there's somebody out there that's like, I want to be just like Lance Stroll. I want to be like Logan we, Sargent. Right. As much as we mock, you know, somebody like Lance Stroll or Logan Sargent. I don't know that I mock Logan Sargent, but I'll just stick with Lance Stroll. But there is somebody out there that's like, oh, I look up to Lance Stroll, right? Or I look up to, you know. Esteban Ocon or whatever, right? And just because Lewis is a very popular driver, it ha it can't just be, oh, Lewis, because it's you, you get a fine. But if it was Lance Stroll, oh, maybe not. And that's how it sounds, right? Like, yeah. no, you shouldn't be crossing a hot track. Lewis said, yep, that was very stupid of me. I'm very <laughs> sorry. And they could say, hey, crossing a hot track causes this penalty or in the future it causes this penalty. But I just hate the whole, like, for the children perspe perspective of it. Like, somebody's yeah. looking up to you. Because what hot track am I running across? Or <laughs> some other, like, young carding four-year-old or whatever is going to be like, well, Lewis can run across the track, so I'm going to run across the track. I just, I think that's such a yeah. it's weak sauce. Either penalize him or don't. I agree with you. I, it's, a you weird, know. it's weird reasoning. That's a, that's a difficult albatross to hang around Lewis's neck, seriously. I mean, he can't help it that he's got a lot of followers and he's influential. But I, yeah, I, I, I'm totally on board with you on that. I think that's a weak issue. Just if you think that the regulation needs to be tightened, and somebody says, that's "Well, fine. you know, that's... what? Now we can just look at penalties from a week ago." We, yes, we can because we did that with Max. Remember, he stopped in the pit lane, and he got a reprimand, and everybody was just apoplectic that he didn't get a penalty. The following race, the stewards got back together and said, yeah, we kind of missed that one. We probably should have right. gave him a penalty, and going forward, we will. Right? So, yes, they do re-look re or take another look at situation. That's not unprecedented, folks. It I happened think... like two weeks ago. You guys act like it no, never happens. I Well, I know, but I also blame clickbait headlines for that, right? Yeah, because they, yeah, yeah. It, If it's not like some sort of uh, egregious thing, why would I read it right so then they yeah. make it sound like oh the gnashing of the teeth lewis oh you know right like it's oh and this i've got a, i've got a great no shit headline so, to to uh to be a good so, example of that and to me i think that's the downside is that what you lose is the logic behind it or the like calm reasoning behind it or whatever we're trying to provide here which is yes that happens and yes they go back and look at things and yes lewis that was not great and um he acknowledged that it wasn't great and you know for the children is weak sauce and we can move <laughs> on right right and right. let's put something codify something in the rules because inevitably there's something that isn't codified in the rules that should be codified in the rules and unfortunately it's not until it's a safety incident that it then gets codified in the rules yeah you know? the other thing they're doing is they're taking another look at the land stroll uh incident that happened between him and his physio and they said we can confirm uh, that this is a quote. Uh, we can confirm the FIA compliance officers received an apology from Lance Stroll regarding his actions during the 2023 FIA Formula One Qatar Grand Prix. That's a mouthful. Uh, the compliance officers noted this apology and issued a written warning reminding Lance of his responsibilities, the co uh, competitor bound by the FIA Code of Ethics and the other FIA ethical and, con and conduct guidelines set forth by the sporting regulations. The FIA maintains a zero tolerance stance against misconduct and condemns any actions that may lead to physical arrest. End quote. Now, um, my feeling on this, you know, is I have a lot of deference for Lance. I think he's going through a pretty tough time. I think everybody just needs oh, yeah. to leave him the hell alone. He's he's going um, through it. Yeah, he's yeah. going through pretty tough times, and he doesn't need more headlines creating, you know, even more difficult times for Lance. I, you know, well, Lance, if you're out there listening, I know you are. I got a lot of deference for you. I think you're going through a tough time we all have our dragons that we're fighting and a lot of times nobody sees those dragons and i and i appreciate you're going through a tough time so i'm not gonna uh, pile on um 
but having said that, this this incident I think was viewed under the regulations that was outlined. Do you remember when Max shoved Esteban when mm-hmm. they were weighing in yeah. after the race yeah. in 2018? That's I think what created this um, this uh, sporting regulation that Lance now has fallen afoul of. So there you go. Yeah, and and I think too there is a. I mean, yes, I have some sympathy for Lance because he is going through it, but also you can't push people. Right? No, like, no. I don't. You know, it's sort of. I'm, and I'm not saying that that's what you're encouraging here. I'm just no, saying that no, there's no, always no, that no. talk you have with like small children, which is like, I know you're frustrated, but what you can't do is walk over and punch Hit your sibling somebody. because yeah, you're right. fast. You know, right? Like, or yeah. you can't just like throw all your toys across the room, break everything. Like that right. is not the way you deal with that emotion. So right, I right. get it. He's he's his dad is basically you know like claiming Alonzo is his new son. It's got to be hard and. um yeah, this is not how you saw the seasoning going, and and it was pretty promising. And I think yeah. that's the other thing too is that um, everything that Aston Martin's experiencing, we never blame Alonso, right? Right. Alonso is a superior driver. We're all like, look at what he did at McLaren, right? Like if he can get that car to an eight, you know, P eight, it's really uh, it really deserves to be P fourteen or something, right? Like, there's so much about Alonso's natural talent you know and and life experience the guy's like 41 and he's he's driven more kinds of cars and worked with different people and more kinds of teams that just comes with that experience yeah and then you have lance and nobody says oh well it's not lance it's the car you know nobody (laughs) gives him that same space that we give alonzo and even though he may not deserve it because he's not alonzo but that's got to hurt. And it's got to hurt that his whole life he's heard, like, you're just here because dad paid for this. Or, you know, I mean, yeah, like, it's, it's, you know, it's a tough situation. I mean, you know, I, I, it's so easy for me to sit in an armchair and, and get critical of it. I yeah. guarantee you, if I jump in a car uh, with Lance, he's going to drive circles around me. I mean, it's not that and he can't drive, he can. Yeah. And there's people everywhere. I mean, I think there's something. I don't know. I mean, I've never quite been in a situation. I don't think that's quite that frustrating, but certainly there's times where it's like, I'm just going to have to like walk around the block. I'm going to go walk, get a coffee. Like, cause I am not in a good headspace right now, but that's much harder to do when you're in that such a public space. Right. Yeah, and that is. there isn't really, and on uh, TV, you, know, you don't really have a, <laughs> yeah, you don't have a stew room somewhere to like, just <laughs> step aside necessarily. Yeah. And, Right. And scream and then come back like the rest of us do, right? You can't like go cry in the bathroom and then go back to your cubicle. <laughs> I need so, a stew room. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I need that. That's what they that call it on a, on Top Chef when they're waiting for the judges to, you know, oh, render the decision. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, bring right. everybody out and they're like, You're the bottom three, you're the top three, and yeah. then they send them to the stew room. And so, um which is also what I call the cool down room in Formula One. Like, oh look yeah. at them hanging out in the stew room. Right. right? So it's perfect. It becomes pretty good. So the other story I want to talk about is this whole concept of mandatory pit stops. Now, you may read. Do do all of you remember the Qatar Grand Prix tire debacle? Yeah. Yes. No. Yeah. Mm. From like a week ago? Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Short memories around here these days. I don't know. Um, I'm on a 24-hour social media cycle. If it didn't happen 24 hours, I forgot about it. Um, So you remember how it prompted all the teams to engage in basically a three-stopper with lap limits on tires set at 18 laps? Remember all that fun we done had Mm. just a week ago? Well, while I thought it was a debacle, there are some out there in the the social media worlds who thought the idea was great. And and it was exciting, and they loved it, and that going forward, they felt that F1 should mandate pit stops to, quote, spice up the show, right? No. Now, <laughs> I've been reading these comments, and I'm like, okay, this is the same sentiment that begat these HD tires to begin with, and which it was them that was deemed not to be fit for purpose for Qatar's curbing, which put us in this whole situation to begin with. So the right. sentiment that you think, oh my gosh, that three pit stop, 18 lap limit is fun. We should do that for every race. It's that kernel. It's that kernel of evil that prompted us to do HD yeah. tires to begin with, because it was in Canada when somebody didn't have the right tires and they were they were uh, uh, artificially wearing way too fast. And so they had to make multiple pit stops and it was super exciting. And somebody said, 
bing, light bulb moment. We should make high de- degradation tires so they don't last the whole race. Wouldn't that be fun? And that's why we are where we are, because it's those high degradation tires that weren't fit for purpose at Qatar that got us into this. So you see how this starts. It all starts back in Canada. It's a very bad idea. And I'm glad that Red Bull's Christian Horner has weighed in and explains it correctly on why this is a bad idea. He said this, quote, I think you've got to give the freedom and that creates the creativity. Mandated pit stops, question mark, it will have effects on the end of qualifying and how many laps you do in qualifying to save tires for the race. So that to me it doesn't make sense. If you want to run, you want to run your, uh, you want to run your fastest car, and whether it's in one stop, a two stop, or a three stop, that's where we need to be at. End quote. Um, and I agree with them a hundred percent. It's a very bad idea, and one that I hope F1 doesn't resort to in an effort to make casual F1 fans more excited about the sport because it's a very bad idea. What do I you think, think- Grace? I think it's a terrible idea, first of all. (laughs) But I think what it actually points out is to me, if somebody said that to me, if you were like, hey, Grace, I think this is a good idea. I would say you don't understand. I wouldn't say it this way because now I sound like a real jerk. But um, I I think you don't understand how strategy works and why strategy makes it interesting, right? Like, So to me, this is actually on Formula One doesn't explain why this is. If you don't see why this is a bad idea... I see that as a failing of Formula One to explain why you always have some window of pit stops, right? And But you want that to be a window of five laps, ten laps, something like right. that. That's what makes it interesting. You want to know if somebody's going to dive in or not, or if the, first, if the leader goes in, who's going to follow him? Like, if you, mandata- if you make it mandatory that everybody can only run X number of laps on a tire, you've eliminated that creativity as christian horner put it so yeah right. to me i think it is a misunderstanding of how strategy is what makes this sport interesting but again I, I i spoke on our last podcast about football right like you can watch football just to watch quarter uh, watch touchdowns right like that's clearly a thing and that's clearly fine yeah yeah but you're only going to get a surface level out of football formula right. is the same thing right if you're not right. watching for strategy and when is somebody going to pit and when they're not going to pit then you're never going to really get everything out of Formula One. So it's fine if you're just watching for touchdowns. If you're just watching to see who makes it to the podium or who has the big crash or whatever, that's fine. But you're never going to get the depth out of it because who, right. when they make pit stops and undercutting people and all of that is what makes it interesting. That's what makes it a chess match and not checkers, right? And so right. I think that is a failing on... I don't know, somebody's part, our part, Formula One's part, to really explain to people why this was a bad idea and yeah, why right. we're like, yo, this is not yo. great. Because I can see how on the surface this sounds like an interesting idea, but really you want the team, you want the Bernies on the team to be able to like, you know, that's, you want the strategist to do it. Although yeah. maybe Ferrari, maybe Ferrari would have more success if we mandate, mandated <laughs> when the pit stops were. Wouldn't that be remove, great? St- remove strategy from it. So maybe right. it was just a bunch of Ferrari fans. Yeah, yeah could have were, been. Maybe it was just all of Fred Vassour and his burner accounts. Just yeah. like, yeah. Uh, this is a great idea. We should keep doing this. Strategy. Yeah. Ooh, who needs Boo, strategy? Who needs strategy? Uh, we don't need any of that. No, right. But that's, uh, that's what makes it interesting. And I think that with a single tire manufacturer, the, you've already taken enough of the creativity out yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. completely suck the creativity out of right. the pit stop by mandating when they have to, yeah. when they have to pit. Agreed. All right. Let's, uh, let's do some Alvin's Cats. Shall we? Let me yeah. try that again. Here. Should I try it again? Sure. <laughs> yes. It's it's that time for Alvin's cats. Lewis um, Hamilton, Lewis Hamilton. Oh, I still have that. Lewis oh. Hamilton, Lewis Hamilton. There's, no There's no stopping him, Grace. There know. isn't. Uh, so okay, hit me. You have any Alvin's cats this week? Um, I do, of course. Um, so first of all, if you, the race puts, you know, they put out a lovely little shorts or whatever, some lovely little information that you can watch on the YouTube's. And they did one talking about uh, Michael Andretti, friend of the show, uh, Michael Andretti, (laughs) 
and his <laughs> his nightmare time at McLaren, right? I, uh. It's actually called the Wild Theories around Michael Michael Andretti's McLaren nightmare. So many people are like, I don't know why Grace hates Michael Andretti. Well, reason number one: watch that video; it'll become very clear, right? But so what Keep I really in mind, wanna... Grace is a McLaren fan. Just FYI, yeah. Yeah, it, that wasn't apparent. Right, I don't have my yeah. somewhere behind me. Is my big flag, right? Like, um, anyway. So, uh, right. Um, what it was funny though is I totally lost my train of thought, but it's back. Don't worry. Uh, so, yeah. So that was one of the reasons yeah. that you have issue. Yeah. So, right. There are others, but we'll just right. stick with that one. So what the best part of the video is they talk about how like, so Michael Andretti's teammate is Senna, right? And so of course, as you can imagine, not so great for Michael Andretti and he has all these DMFs and uh, it just is abysmal. And especially when your teammate is, you know, Aaron and Senna, not great. And so, first of all, I I had to pause the the video because I was laughing so hard because they were like, and then Ron Dennis said that he gave Michael Andretti a motivational speech. What kind of a motivational speech does Ron Dennis give to somebody? I'd love to have heard that. I would I love like, to have heard that. Did Ron Dennis say that with a straight face? I, I was like, that's like Bill Belichick giving you uh, a motivational speech. What what is what is that? I would never. I mean, James Vowles, yes, I would go to him for a motivational speech, but Ron Dennis giving a Ron, like, you would think that motivational speech would like he would have given you a once over with a lint roller. Yeah, yeah. I just was like I went on for like a way Flip always thinks this is funny that like the video itself is like 7 minutes long, but my rant is easily like 15 minutes, <laughs> yeah, right? Right, like, right? Right, right. My rant is right. much longer than the piece ever was that we're watching. So first right. of all, I was just like Ron Dennis giving a motivational speech is the funniest thing I've ever heard of in this video. And then they talk about how, you know, because they had Mika Hockaden as their as the reserve driver and what were they going to do and was Senna going to leave? And then they, then they cut to a, a quote and Ron Dennis is like, yes, and I told Michael Andretti, I need you out of the car by France. That is Ron Dennis. And that's, <laughs> that's a motivational Ron. speech from Ron Dennis. Yeah. I need you out of the car by France. Yeah. All right. That, so, that there's a motivational speech. I agree. But, with you. Yes. but I think it gets into a lot of why people are sus about Michael Andretti or don't care, especially if you don't watch IndyCar or you're just like, you know, you're, you're whatever. And you're just like, I don't know why everybody's all up on my, on Michael Andretti. Watch this video. I think it gives you a nice insight to why people are like, really that guy because he really i mean it was a 93 but really didn't leave a great taste in anybody's mouth so yeah as a mcclain uh, yes yeah well or in general but anyway <laughs> so there was that so watch it i recommend it and and just take a moment to think about what a ron dennis motivational speech must look like because that sounds glorious <laughs> i yeah. wonder if he's on uh cameo i wonder if i could pay ron dennis some money <laughs> to give me a motivational speech on ca via that would cameo. be good that would be that's a great idea, actually. It is. I'm sure Ron could use a couple hundred. It would be, that would be great. Yeah, I'm you sure know, do that. that's 10, 15 quid, you know? Yeah, it's nothing. Good. That would be great. All right. So then I also wanted to mention, because ne'er would a podcast go by, especially at this part of the season, where I don't mention MotoGP, because mm. what are you people doing with your lives? That's right. Um, so between the sprint race and the race race, we, uh, you know, Martin was, the championship leader and then he wasn't the championship leader but when does that happen in formula one never so go watch some moto gp but i really wanted to bring up yet another the race does a podcast a moto gp podcast and they did uh send in your questions about mark marquez and with his move to grassini and it's also another very interesting thing if you're like does anybody have anything for mark marquez yeah so if you're if you're new and you're or we need a refresher because there were things in there. I was like, oh, right. I forgot about that. It's a great like primer on Mark Marquez and why he's the jam and why everybody talks about him. So very good. But anyway, one of the questions offered up was by our own Karun Chanhook. So apparently he's also a MotoGP fan, which I did not oh. know. Yeah, and, Karun's uh, a fan of everything. He's a fan yes. of life, that Karun. He sure is. So I was just like, oh, look, an excuse to actually bring up MotoGP in a way that is related to Formula One. There you go. And I didn't even have to work Jack doing in there. So um, <laughs> nice. The the final thing I really wanted to bring up was so I, I'm there's the whole Bernie Eccleston, um, you know, court civil court uh, case. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So but and I don't really want to rehash that. But what really stuck out to me more was that he's going to pay eight hundred and three million dollars in his settlement. That is enough 
to fund Michael Andretti's entry into Formula <laughs> One and like a year in the sport. It is. What kind, what kind of dough does this man just have lying around that Bernie Eccleston could bring Michael Andretti into the sport and just be like, and we're racing now. We'll call yeah. Eccleston Andretti and we'll just get an engine and it'll be fine. I Bernie, wonder if why his, don't you do that? I wonder if his wife and daughters are going to like, wait. You're 90 some odd years. You had to pay how much? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> and and what does that leave us? What? Nothing. Uh. Nothing, nothing. But I just, it was just like, you know how you measure things in like Starbucks so that you can understand like how expensive something is? I like the idea of like how much Bernie Eccleston had to give over in his settlement by how many entries he could have paid for into Formula One. You could have, you could have probably got two entries two. in for that much money. Yeah. You know, so. That's, uh. That was, that's, a, that's a lot of money. <sighs> it is. Bernie. It's a lot so. of money. All right. All right. Time for some no shit headlines. Uh, first headline is, quote, Lewis Hamilton could force Red Bull to sack driver after Mercedes stars 12 word comment. What? What kind of clickbait headline is that? This is like an anagram or something. Wait. I know. It's like, what? Oh, that's just. That's a shit headline. I'm sorry, so what folks. Were, what were the 12 words? I, 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 I didn't even oh. click on it. I wouldn't even grace it with a click. If you've got to bait me so bad as to say with one 12-word comment, I cured skin tags using this one 12-word comment. My toe fungus <laughs> went away using this one 12-word comment. Okay, so now I think this is what people need to put in the comments. What 12 word, if you already know, you make like wrong answers only. What yeah. 12 word comment did Lewis have right. that forced Red Bull to sack a driver? What, yes, and the comments what, what just pop it down it there. Grace yeah. is right. You tell 12 us what words. 12 word comment could force Red Bull to sack a driver. Yeah, like <sighs> Sergio Perez is the greatest driver in the world. I, that's not 12 words, but you know, come up with something. And that'll be fun. Yeah. And it'll so be better than whatever they actually said he said. Here's the next one, not to leave Lewis Ham Hamilton out. So this is the next one, quote, Lewis Hamilton snubbed as Carlos Sainz named most intelligent or more intelligent than Mercedes man. Let me read that again. Oh. Lewis Hamilton snubbed as Carlos Sainz named more intelligent than Mercedes man. Okay. The actual comment was made by Yuki. It had absolutely zero to do with Lewis Hamilton. Nothing right. to do with Lewis Hamilton. He was asked who he thought the more cunning, smartest driver on the grid was. And he said, boy, he thought either Alonzo or Sainz. He thought both of them yeah. are pretty tough, right? And that's yeah, what he said. Right. That's all he said. It had nothing to do with Lewis. It's just, it was just Yuki's personal assessment of some of the drivers he's raced against on the grid. It could have easily have been said, this headline said, Max Verstappen snubbed as Carlos Sainz named more intelligent than Red Bull man. It, yeah. it, it could have easily said that, but it didn't. We had to go after Lewis and drum up outrage. That's so pathetic. Although I think, you know, the be way better. Yeah. Be more Good creative. Grief. I, I think the way it's phrased, though, it makes me think like Mercedes man is a person, like the Michelin man. Like, like the Lewis Bendem, Ham yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lewis Hamilton snubbed as Carlos Sainz is more intelligent than Bibidium. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. The Michelin man. Lewis Hamilton is Mercedes Bibidium. Yeah, I just think... Uh, I like it. It's That's great. I, I mean, I don't know. That's random. So the next headline okay. is... Uh, oh, apologies for my dog. I wasn't planning I know on you have that. Some very unhappy puppies out there. I do. I wasn't planning on that being the soundtrack to this podcast, but apparently Aww. it is. Sorry. Um, let's see. Uh, this next one's fun. Racing legend Nigel Mansell rakes in eye-watering sum, flogging memorabilia from his glittering F1 career. <laughs> now, now some right. of my British friends are going to have to help me with that because it was in a British rag, right? Yeah. Now, I don't know if flogging over here would have a negative connotation. Yeah saying that you're running around flogging memorabilia. Mm -hmm. It would have a negative connotation. Yeah. Uh, well, physically, yes, the actual literal translation. But even from a sales, you know, it's sort of a yeah. snake oil salesman or opportunistic run around flogging. It's, no, that's, okay. you know, this it's is not, a more, it's a pejorative. 
It's a more interesting story to think of Nigel Mansell selling his stuff off as a snake oil salesman. Like, like he yeah. peeled off the stickers yeah. or like repainted right. stuff, you right. know, and it's like terrible handwriting, you know, yeah. like it's not his memorabilia that he's selling off. Right. Like that's, and he's got, that's much he's got fun. like uh, Heinz Hill friends and acting <laughs> like a shill in the crowd. He's like, I'm sorry, sir. How much was that Nigel Mansell uh, oh, uh, balaclava? Yeah. 6,000. I'll take two of them, sir. Yeah, it's That's right. a bargain. It's- that would exactly. I like this story. I mean, because you're right. Clearly, flogging must have some different term. You know, must. Uh, I assume have some it does because it's meaning, a pejorative but, over here. Yeah. But I like it much better as a pejorative. I think it's a much yeah. better story that way. And if it means Nigel the Mandel. same, if it means the same over in the UK, and again, British listeners, let me know. But if it means the same thing over there it, with its negative connotation, it's pretty harsh. I mean, Nigel yeah. Mansell's the champion, and he should be able to yes. go and sell his memorabilia. Of course, yeah. he should, right? That's crazy. Uh, let's see. Uh, finally, uh, F1 cult hero looks unrecognizable with bushy gray beard after amazing transformation since racing heyday. No, Damon Hill. I don't know. I who saw <laughs> no. I saw the picture. To be fair, I didn't know who it was in the picture. Okay. I had to go look. It was Heinz Harold Frunson. Oh my gosh! I haven't seen. <laughs> and I thought, him. Okay, wait a minute. F1 cult hero. I guess I've missed the entire cult thing about Heinz Hill Friends, and maybe it's a big cult thing in Germany that I'm not hip is, to. Is there one? Well, that's what I'm asking. I didn't know there was a cult following. He was a cult hero for somebody. Maybe in Germany? I don't know. If I'm missing it, I'm not taking anything away from Heinz. He's a good guy. But I just, yeah, that was news to me. Yeah, I don't think HHF is a anybody's no. cult hero. F1 cult I, hero Tio Fabi looks unrecognizable. Is like Tio Fabi was a cult hero, really? Yeah, I don't. Mm. I was, yeah. Okay. I thought it was going to be like, yeah, Sebastian Vettel. I don't know who. Yeah. That, I would have never come up with. This would be great for your, um, you know, mid season or your uh, off season trivia. You yeah, know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have never come up with uh, Hyde Harold Francis. No, That's I wouldn't not... either. I wouldn't either. Not who have I picked. All right, let's do some speaking, mail. I was gonna say, speaking of tire debacles, Hyde Harold Frenson. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You've got mail. Let's do some mail, shall we? Uh, Sean asked this. He says, Todd Grace, what do you know about the Lawrence selling the team to Aramco? I heard a rumor. Okay. I heard a rumor. <laughs> you were thinking that, weren't you? I was. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, well, Sean, I've read those two. I've read the rumors. It was a rumor going around. And my answer to that is who knows? It, it could have legs to it, but sometimes when they're selling shares or a percent of ownership, it sometimes gets misconstrued as that they're selling the whole thing. Um, when that hasn't been the case, I know sometimes McLaren, when they were increasing, decreasing ownership with uh, the Middle East investment and stuff, said, oh my gosh, Ron Zonis is selling out. And he wasn't. He was selling a portion, not even controlling interest. So um, would it surprise me? Um, I, no. Do, do I mm-hmm. think there could be some reshuffling with Honda coming on board mm-hmm. uh, as an engine supplier or Aramco's interest? In some ownership or more ownership, uh, possibly. I don't know. Hard to tell. Um, I would say the thing that tells me it's not true is that Lawrence is a pretty shrewd business guy. And yes. he's bitten off a lot with Aston Martin, but he's also been very, of everything I've ever, all the interviews I've seen about Lawrence, about whether it was Aston Martin proper or Aston Martin F1 team, he has been incredibly bullish about them. And it would be this bullish position that he takes about his investment, long-term goals, building the HQ, what he wants to do with the road car division. Just recently announcing he's going into uh, the um, hypercar with uh, the Valkyrie and Le Mans, uh, the Formula One program, uh, advancing that, the hiring of all the people. that He's just really bullish about what he's doing with this team. And that would tell me that that doesn't sound like a guy who's trying to, to sell it to me. No, I mean, I think that's the thing, too. I think he's putting a lot of effort for something that he's just going to flip. But that doesn't seem like the case here. Yeah, he doesn't sound like a house flipper to me. Right. I, yeah. I, and I agree. I'm sure he's probably getting, you know, selling some share. That would make Maybe. total sense. It's expensive. Yeah. It's an expensive sport. And so that right. makes sense. But I, I don't, I agree. I don't think he's like, right. I spent my entire last five years putting this team together and I built entirely new right. facilities and I have these. 
other, you know, car programs going on and and I'm just going to flip it to Aramco and have a nice day. I don't I don't see that. Yeah, I don't either. Seem to fit. Yeah, I agree. Anyway, all right. Well, that does it for this podcast. What we think about the news we just talked about and uh, let did. us know what you think about the news we just talked about. You can do that over at theparkformay.com. Just do it to Quorum Civility. Huge thank you to our uh, Patreon supporters out there. I posted uh, uh, a um, couple things uh, for you. I did a interview. Um, I was I was the interviewer e <laughs> in a podcast about Vegas. A guy named uh, Jeff yeah. does Vegas. A really nice guy. And he does this podcast about Vegas, and it was he wanted to talk about the Vegas GP, and uh, I was uh, on that. And I had a really good time. It was a great interview. He's a great guy. Uh, if you're interested in listening to that, just Google Jeff Does Vegas, and you'll see his website, the link. He's on all the you know Spotify and all that stuff too, uh, yeah. and you can see uh, pictures of it uh, on my Twitter account and that kind of thing. But anyway, I also put it on our Facebook page and Facebook fan group, um, and you can find it there. But Anyway, really good guy. I had a great time. That just went up today, uh, and I had a great time talking about Vegas. And if you want to get my thoughts on that, you can. Also, I posted something to our Patreon uh, supporters. Uh, I switched over to a new system to record podcasts. Uh, this is the first episode we're doing it. So if anything's weird, audio's weird or anything like that, let me know. Um, but one thing it does allow for is to have an audience that can sit in live with us while we're recording. And uh, I was thinking about doing that for our Patreon supporters. That'd and be so fun. I put that on our Patreon page and, and I just said, you know, I'm thinking about doing that. Let me know if you're interested as a Patreon supporter of doing that because I could send out invites and you guys could all join those of you in the right time zone or, or, or that are awake. Or you, you want to get up at two in the morning, whatever, whatever, whatever and, time and zone you can in. do it via a uh, app. They have a mobile app or you can log in and you could be in the audience and you could listen along and send us messages in the chat. So uh, we could do even like a prolonged Q&A if you'd like to. So anyway, let me know what you guys think about that. Um, if you like this podcast, go to iTunes and all your favorite uh, podcast players and give us some love over there. Give us some uh, decent uh, reviews. We'd appreciate that as always. And until next week, when I'll be back with the young and effervescent Paul Charsley, the sporting manager yes. at Aston Martin Heart of Racing team, uh, I'll be back with him to review the United States Grand Prix. So that's going to mm -hmm. be super exciting. It'll be, what, a week or two weeks or three? I can't remember now, Grace. I'm going to have to look that up before I Grace is the, back on. So, I only know the MotoGP calendar. I have no idea what the Formula One calendar yeah, is. Yeah, so it's back to back. So it'll be two weeks go. for Grace. So okay. until that time next week, uh, this is Todd, a.k.a. Negative Camera, saying so long, Grace. See you in, it in two weeks. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. <laughs>